Good evening. I would like to talk about the body. It's my favorite subject. And I, specifically, I would like to talk about bodies in relationship to one another. I'm a movement teacher, a movement educator, I'm a martial artist. And I would like to make a case. I would like to make the case that what we need to do is bring the body back into our modern lives. Because we've somehow, we've lost touch with our bodies. We need to bring the body back into full participation in everything that we do in the modern world. And that means bringing the body back into our schools, into our workplaces, into our universities, into our management uh, policies, and back into our homes. We desperately need the body back. It's a big part of how we make decisions and how we perform in the modern world. Now, I've had some people suggest to me, they say, well, Frank, that's a, that's a universal interest. Men have bodies, women have bodies. Isn't everyone interested in the body? Why is that a women's issue? And I think that's all true. I also believe that women have a special interest here and a special concern about health and matters of the body. There's, a, there's sort of a special orientation towards health that a lot, a lot of women bring. And this has been backed up and verified by a couple of really interesting new scientific disciplines. One is neurobiology. And the other one is the field of epigenetics. And these two fields working together, they've discovered that conditions in the womb have profound downstream consequences for child development reaching all the way into, a, into our modern environment. So what is the state of the body in the modern world? It's kind of a mixed bag, isn't it? Because we're living longer than ever before in modern history. A lot of people point to this as a big success story, and in a way it is. But there's also an immense downside right now. We are afflicted by a lot of these so-called lifestyle diseases. And you're familiar with the list, right? Heart disease, obesity, diabetes, depression, and neurological disorders and attention problems in both children and adults. And this list, all of those diseases are lifestyle related. None of those are infectious. These are what the World Health Organization has described as non-communicable diseases. They, they don't have anything to do with bacteria or viruses. They are strictly lifestyle diseases. And these, these diseases extract an immense toll worldwide. Millions of people die every year from physical inactivity and stress-related diseases. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Our bodies are under assault in other ways as well. Not only do we have to suffer this disease, but there's also an epidemic of what I call physical unhappiness. A lot of people that I talk to and I hear about, I read, have very unhappy relationships with their bodies. As a coach and a trainer, I hear this narrative all the time, and it sounds like this. I hate my body. <laughs> right? I hate the way it looks. I hate the way it feels. I hate the fact that it hurts all the time. And I really hate the fact that it can't do what I want it to do. So what's up with that? Why are we so unhappy living in our bodies in the modern world? This, this strikes me as, as kind of a new affliction in its own right. And it's, it's really catastrophic. It's really sad. But that's not the whole story either, because there's also a sense of values here. As a culture, I don't believe that we really value the human the human body very much. I don't think we value our physical experience and our vitality. Just look at the way we treat uh, physical education in schools. We don't value that. That's the first thing to be kept. We don't treat PE teachers very well either. Now this, is, this has been a TED theme in the past, and a lot of you have probably seen Ken Robinson's legendary TED talk where he describes, he talks about education and creativity in the schools. And he talks about our 
view of what the body is and what it should do. And he says, we view the body simply as a transport mechanism for the head. <laughs> so the, the role of the body is simply to get the head from one meeting to another meeting. <laughs> it's just a transport mechanism for the brain, right? And typically now what we do is we try to get the brain from one computer terminal to another computer terminal where we can do this and we can do this or we can do this. <laughs> Other people have described this approach to the body and the brain. They say, well, now what we have is a brain on a stick. <laughs> so you've got the brain, and you've got the stick, and the purpose of the body in the modern world now is simply to hold the stick. <laughs> As if that's all the body is good for, to hold the stick and move the stick around from place to place. <laughs> so this is... This is tragic. You take the disease, you take the physical unhappiness, and this apathy, this low value that we place on physical experience, and this is what you get. So how did we get to this state? How did we get to this place where the body is, is so distressed? And I think it comes down to a single word, and that's mismatch. Our bodies are ancient. Our bodies are aboriginal. Our bodies are millions of years old. And we live in an environment that's radically, drastically different from that environment that we evolved in. The reason we are here today is that we are very successful at surviving in outdoor, wild environments such as we find in East Africa. Every detail of our anatomy and our physiology is the way it is because of tens of thousands of generations of living and dying on the grasslands of East Africa. Our anatomy, our physiology, and our psychology are all products of that evolutionary experience. Millions of years. And now, in the blink of an eye, we live in this world that's drastically, radically different. And it's happened almost instantaneously in the last, people trace it to agriculture, but really the most drastic changes have come in the last several hundred years and now in the last 50 years. So we are living in what I call an alien environment. It's alien because of sedentary living, it's an alien nutritional environment, it's an alien sensory environment, and it's an alien social environment. It's alien in just about every way you can name. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do about this, what I call the primates predicament? Living in this alien environment, this modern world, that we're really not designed to live in. What are we going to do? A lot of people have suggested that we need technological solutions. We need things that do this, or things that do this, or things that do this. A lot of people have suggested we need more information about our health and our body. And I disagree. I think what we need is experience. We need experience of living in our bodies. We need experiential education. The act of being physical is the most important thing. Information is good to have. Technology is good to have. But those are supplemental. The most important thing we have to do is fall in love with movement and get back into our bodies. This has to happen. If we don't fall in love with movement, if we don't get back into our bodies, all the information in the world isn't going to help. So I want to share my experience of discovering my body and my physicality. And that goes back over 30 years now to when I started in the martial arts. And at the time, I went to the dojo, and I put on my white belt, and I signed a contract, and I started training really hard, and I did what Sensei told me to do, and I was at the dojo every night, and I learned, I learned a lot of valuable lessons there. I learned how to move my body, and how to use my hips, and all sorts of things. I learned how to focus, and I learned how to flow, and that was all great. But the most important thing that I learned was how to play and how to dance. Dance for us. <laughs> <laughs> I first learned how to play and how to dance 
when I got my brown belt, and one day I went to the dojo, and one of the other uh, ranking belts asked me to spar. And this was before class, and this was an informal warm-up session where we simply bowed to each other and said, let's go light, let's, let's spar light. And the idea there is not to achieve victory or, or to dominate your opponent or, or to win a match. No, the idea there is just to have a study, a little study of motion, a study of distance, a study of posture, and see what you come up with. It, it's not competitive, it's not adversarial at all. It's just a study. So we started to move, and we started to, to look at the movement. We started to observe and measure how we were doing. And we started to sweat. We started to move a little bit faster. And now the dance was really coming on. And we were really starting to play at this point. And the moves became really fast and really surprising, kind of on the edge. And then we started to laugh. And we were just consumed by delight at that point because there was something about this play, this robust, rough and tumble play, that really brought us a lot of excitement a lot of joy. And that experience was so profound for me that it has sustained me, not just for weeks or months or years, but for decades across my life. And I still seek it out. A lot of people wonder about how to be motivated on an exercise program. Well, this is what did it for me. And even to this day, I'm, I'm bike wearing people in off the street and say, hey, let's, let's play, let's do this thing. And, <laughs> so it's been, it's been wonderful for me, the dance, the play. It also led me to a study of play and play behavior. And I looked not just at people, but I looked at non-human animals and their play behaviors. And I learned some fascinating things. All mammals play. There's 4,000 species of mammals on the earth, and they all play. Play is ancient. Play is much older than we are as a species. Play is probably tens of millions of years old. So it serves a real fundamental purpose in animal evolution. And the benefits are, are amazing. It not only helps us physically, as, as exercise would, playful movement, it has the same benefits that, that, that exercise does. But it also promotes brain development. When you play hard and sweat and move and do novel things, your brain produces growth factors that encourage the growth of neurons. That's great. It also has psychological effects, too, because play promotes resilience. When you get in the habit of doing new movements, trying new things, seeing things from different perspectives, you enhance your ability to rebound after setbacks. This is well known, it, it, it's well studied. The other benefit of play is social. And this is where I think it's, it's very influential and very much overlooked. There's something about play, especially rough and tumble play, that seems to help um, social primates sort out their relationships with one another, and it leads to better social functioning in adulthood. And we know this to be true because we can isolate, uh, say, in a, in a group of uh, litter mate of rats or, or rodents, you isolate individuals out so that they can't play. We intentionally deprive them of play, and then we reintroduce them later on, and we discover that their social behaviors are profoundly abnormal at that point. So there's something about play that helps us to be better at social function as adults. Now the lessons here should be obvious. What we are doing as a culture to each other now amounts basically to play deprivation. What we are doing with, with children depriving them of recess, adults working so hard as we do, this is a form of play deprivation. And it makes sense to link that up to some of the social problems that we experience. But it's not just play. When I think back about my experience in martial arts, the other thing that we developed was a sense of rapport. That's a great word. Rapport is often talked about as nonverbal communication. I like to think of it as a physical conversation. 
So when I set up with my sparring partner, we started to move and observe each other's bodies in motion. We fell into this physical conversation of speaking and listening, talking and listening. The best sparring partners are the ones who listen the best. The best musical partners, the best business partners, the best lovers, these are all the people who are the best listeners. So that rapport skill is really important for social function. We also see that in play. When, when young animals, puppies, or kittens play with it, one another, they develop this physical conversation of rapport back and forth. Now, how do, we, how do we engineer this rapport with each other? How is it that we can establish this physical conversation? We do that through what's called the mirror neuron system. This is really hot right now if you study any kind of neuroscience. Mirror neuron system is simply a cluster of neurons in your brain that has two functions. It can produce movement, very simple, just command and control, can stimulate movement, but the same cells also respond to the observation of movement. So if I'm watching you guys move your bodies, I'm firing those cells just by observing the movement of other, of other animals, other creatures around me. Now think about that. This is fascinating stuff because what happens is I observe you move your body and I run a little simulation of that movement in my brain. And when I do that, I get there's some emotional content to that. So I see you move your body, I have some sense of what emotion you are feeling at that time and vice versa. So if I was standing up here like this and holding my body in such a way, you wouldn't have, even have to hear any words out of my mouth. You would know what emotional state I was in. This is fascinating stuff, right? Because by observing other people's bodies, yeah, we can have some emotional resonance with each other. A lot of neuroscientists now believe that this is the foundation for empathy. And that's powerful. And it's very necessary. But think what we're doing. We don't spend that much time working with bodies anymore. We, we strap ourselves into seats, at computer terminals, with keyboards, and we don't really look at one another very much in motion. So that's another case where I think we're making a big mistake by spending too much time on the technology and not enough time in actual proximity to other people. Now, if you study play and dance and rapport, it's inevitable that you're going to develop an interest in oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone of bonding and affiliation. And a lot of people believe it to be a female hormone. Men produce it as well with the same effect. So bonding and affiliation behaviors that are stimulated by this hormone. Oxytocin is a miracle hormone. Because what it does, it increases trust and it decreases fear. So if we can learn how to promote the use of this hormone, the pumping of this hormone in our bodies, we will have done a great thing, not just for ourselves, but for our communities, our tribes, our villages. And that's something that is a whole subject on its own. Keep your eyes open for oxytocin because that's going to be a big new subject going forward. So, to wrap this up, I just want to say it's not just about the health of individuals anymore. Yes, if you play, you dance, you develop rapport, you pump oxytocin, it's good for your individual health, your individual body will get better, that's great, but it's really about us. Because when you do all these things, those are going to have ripple effects and those gains that you make are going to be contagious to other people and you will promote the health of your community. So that's why I say when you change your body, you will change the world. Yeah.